Good morning, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, from where you're joining us from. Uh, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, in this webinar, uh, the story behind uh, bushmeat, the relationship between rising viral diseases and diminishing animal communities. I'll be your host uh, uh, this afternoon, this morning, uh, wherever you are from. Uh, my name is uh, Kyondo uh, Wawero, I'm the project manager uh, for Internews Art Journalism Network. Uh, Art Journalism Network is uh, the environment uh, program of Internews, you know, th that works to improve uh, quality of reportage uh, on matters uh, to do with wildlife, conservation, environment uh, all over uh, the world. Uh, here in East Africa, uh, we work uh, in uh, three, uh, in four uh, countries, Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, and Rwanda. Uh, we are able to do this work uh, with the generous, um, you know, grants uh, from USAID and Department of the Interior. Uh, this webinar uh, is part uh, of a knowledge uh, hub, a knowledge, a biodiversity knowledge hub uh, series, uh, the first uh, of four uh, convenings uh, that we'll do. Uh, the other one. Uh, will be on uh, importance uh, of tree planting, uh, the airports and seaports. And we also have uh, one in-person convening uh, in March uh, that will be very interesting for all of us. Um, as you join us, uh, you are on mute and off video, uh, kindly bear with us. And as you uh, uh, sit down uh, uh, on the icons, we, there is a QA and a and there is a chat icon. We encourage you uh, to ask questions. Uh, kindly use the Q&A um, feature. Don't use the chat. Uh, you can use the chat uh, to say hi. For that, you know, but for the Q&A, you, you allow us to record this webinar and we upload recording later on channel or website uh, that is of the journal. Uh, did you lose me? Hello, sorry, sorry. Uh, technical hitch. Uh, I was saying that uh, we'll upload uh, these recording presentations uh, and uh, the contacts of our guests today. Uh, again, as I said, uh, the story, uh, the webinar is the story behind bushmeat, and it's very important, uh, as it was confirmed in Mubere district yesterday. As we know, uh, the deadly Ebola epidemic that killed more than 11,000 people in West Africa between 2014 and 2016 is believed to have originated from a uh, wild animal. We hope uh, this webinar will highlight this dangerous connection between bushmeat consumption and the rise of these viral diseases, including uh, COVID-19. Our speakers uh, will also be kind enough as to mention uh, this connection uh, in relation to uh, the breaking news uh, from Bende district uh, in Uganda. Uh, the speakers, all of them work in wildlife-rich habitats uh, from Savo in Kenya to Mkomanzi in Tanzania to Queen Elizabeth and Buindil in impenetrable national parks in Uganda. Uh, they will show us the extent uh, of these advice and most importantly, the so solutions uh, that different players uh, have, have put into place uh, to make sure uh, these advice uh, of bushmeat hunting uh, uh, continues. Uh, our first speaker, 
uh, with foundations all AWF landscape ecologist in the Savo Mukomazi landscape. He works uh, with government agencies, community based conservation organizations, and the private sector to streamline sustainable development, ecological monitoring, and conservation of natural resources in areas with high biodiversity value. Kenneth has a Master of Science in Wildlife Management uh, from the University of Eldoret in Kenya. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Kenneth. I hope you're ready uh, to start us off. Good afternoon, uh, Kiwindu and the team and also the participants. Um, um, I'll go straight to my presentation. Um, uh, let me share my presentation. I hope you are able to see my presentation. Yes, we are. Thank you very much. Um, yes, as you said, um, I work in Savo, in Komazi landscape. This is a transboundary landscape between uh, Kenya and Tanzania, especially on the largest uh, conservation area on the Kenyan side, that is Savo and Komazi on the Tanzanian side. So we work in about six districts in Tanzania and about seven uh, counties in Kenya. But let me dive straight to Bushmit. And um, I'm sorry, I'm using data that is in custody of me. So this data might not be a representation of um, uh, data for the whole landscape, but this is based on uh, the scout units that we support within the landscape. And I've just um, selected a few items, especially on uh, the number of poachers, the motorbike, and even giraffe that has been killed because of bushmeat within the landscape. And if you see on the trends or um, on those relations, you can easily see how these are relating to each other. And because most of the bushmeat poachers nowadays, they are using the modern technology in conducting these um, bushmeat cases. Um, motorbikes is uh, one of the main uh, transportation tools within the landscape that people uh, or the bushmeat and even their um, people who are working together uh, use within the landscape. And also I've shown you the giraffe. Um, as you know, the Maasai giraffes that we have in Sabo, uh, they are facing um, either a slight decline or even a stable population. And uh, the reason is a majority of the poaching cases are targeting uh, giraffes for bushmeat, especially to supply to the main towns, either in Nairobi, uh, some uh, towns within uh, Boi, uh, Taveta, and even uh, on the other side in Tanzania, especially in Tarakea and Rombo areas. But again, if you see on the snare that was um, uh, removed by scouts on patrol. You can easily see um, during the rainy season or during the preparation of uh, planting season, most of the cases of snaring goes down, especially in July all the way to December, because most of the people are preparing their lands for cultivation. But immediately after that, you see um, the snares comes back because people are now um, idle and some of them, they don't have jobs. So they engage themselves in bushmeat uh, cases within the landscape. Um, and the main drivers for this bushmeat uh, within the landscape, um, mostly it is because of unemployment and also poverty levels. Uh, most of these regions, uh, the climatic conditions are not favorable for agriculture in most of the areas. And sometimes when people grow their crops, uh, sometimes they, uh, they dry up or they wither on the way because the rains are not enough. And in most cases, uh, people, um, the food security within the landscape is um, very low. And that is why people are depending on bushmeat to rely for either proteins or even for livelihood or even get extra money to 
buy food and other things. But also some of the people are not aware of the laws and regulations in relation to this bushmeat. So some of them even, they don't know how uh, the penalties uh, are in relation to bushmeat. But others, they have cultural beliefs um, that um, they have to depend on bushmeat. Uh, others, they go for quick money, uh, especially people kill giraffes, not because uh, you get a lot of meat or something like that, but um, sometimes they equate a giraffe to um, an equivalent to a motorbike. So when you kill a giraffe within the region, you can easily sell it at black market and get the amount that is equivalent to buy a motorbike that you can use for local uh, transport, the border borders and um, the, the, the like. But also within the region, there is improved transport system and people are now taking advantage of this to transport bushmeat from one place to the other. And uh, it is a, a big challenge. Let me show you a quick example, especially the species that are suffering from this uh, bushmeat within the landscape. Um, the highest percentage of the cases uh, of bushmeat in the region is uh, targeting dig digs. And uh, dig digs, um, probably dig digs are easy to kill. Uh, sometimes it is easy for transportation. And also sometimes they are all over within the landscape. So sometimes uh, people call for them, they call for impalas and the small game. But if you check on the pie chart uh, below, um, if you see the body weight in relation to the number of cases, then you will see Ilan and Giraffe are leading. Because um, if you kill one Ilan, uh, you get a lot of meat or even when you kill a giraffe, you get a lot of meat. And so the number of cases might be low, but uh, the impact to the environment is very high. Uh, the syndicate of bushmeat is uh, very complex. I know this is a simplified fashion, but it is very complex because there is a lot of engagements in between. And mostly people who engage themselves, maybe from the village level, uh, sometimes uh, they engage middle people to connect them to a broker or even connect them to a seller somewhere, either in towns or even within the villages. But also they depend on uh, a network of informers to give them directions on this. So in most cases, bushmeat business is very, very complex. And uh, it is sometimes um, it uh, evolves every now and then. And sometimes they, they fall depending on the law enforcement strategies that are put in place. Uh, among the strategies that we are putting in place to make sure that um, bushmeat cases go down, because we know the impacts of bushmeat, and uh, one of them is um, the population or uh, imbalance is caused by this bushmeat. Sometimes, again, it leads to spread of diseases. As we know, most of the wildlife are the host for most of the zoonotic diseases. But also um, imbalance in terms of, uh, like the carnivores, they depend on these apipos because most of the apipos within this region are targeted for bushmeat. So sometimes even uh, the carnivores now opt to go for livestock instead of wildlife because uh, of bushmeat cases going on and the numbers of these uh, abifos are going down. So we have short-term short and medium-term uh, strategies to, uh, to, to gap uh, issues to do with bushmeat. And um, especially we strengthen the anti-poaching operations through supporting the wildlife authorities and even the community scouts conduct impromptu operations. Uh, we also support join and um, concurrent patrols uh, along the border, especially between Kenya and Tanzania. And this is bringing together uh, Tanzania National Parks, Tanzania Wildlife Authority, and Kenya Wildlife Service to do patrols along the border because most of the poachers take advantage of the porous borders that we have. 
Of course, we enhance regular patrols by supporting uh, scouts, have uh, food ration, uh, fuel, and also equip them to conduct their patrols and make sure that they have dominance within their areas of operation. Of course, we support even the wildlife authorities to have um, a very strong informal networks. As I said, uh, even the, uh, the Bushmeat poachers themselves, they have informers. And also even the law enforcement need to up their game by having a very strong informal network to give them information so that now they can conduct the joint operations, impromptu operations, and even on their regular patrols. But also we need to control movements and have barriers in some of the areas, especially in the ranches where uh, people use motorbikes to conduct bushmeat uh, um, poaching. So barriers are put in some of the areas to just put a, a check in control on this. Sometimes we enhance counter wildlife trafficking, especially by having canine units in place to just uh, track some of these cases. Also, we lay uh, support the law enforcement um, authorities to conduct ambushes in some of the areas, especially where they have uh, intelligence information, but also work with the customs and immigration departments to strengthen border controls. But also we want to increase conviction rates uh, in case where we arrest people. So we improve on scene of crime management. Um, we also make sure that we have evidence collected that will prove some of these cases. And sometimes even bushmeat, we need to protect that as an evidence. So we have um, um, rooms where you can store this bushmeat for some time. As you know, some of them are perishable. And you need to, pro to, 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 to bring these uh, evidences to court and even during presentation through forensic analysis and the others. But also we do engage uh, prosecutors and judicial officers on wildlife laws and also on what is happening on the ground. On the long-term strategies, um, we, 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 we are of the opinion that we need to look for options. Because the reason why these people are engaging themselves in bushmeat is because of lack of alternative livelihoods. So we are now thinking of investing in livestock production so that people can now get uh, revenues and also get livelihood and also food for, to support their families and also engage in smart agriculture because of climate change and the others. So it is good to engage in other ways of uh, doing agriculture instead of rain fed agriculture. We have a program in uh, mentoring uh, youth and children so that they, they are champions to conservation and also be our mode of change to their parents or even uh, their relatives who are engaging in bushmeat. And uh, this needs a very um, long uh, engagement. Of course, we engage in policy to see how best we can improve on the policy to enhance um, uh, poverty reduction in some of the areas, bring in climate change uh, adaptations and others. But also we are thinking of engaging the ex-convicts as um, based on our data, we've seen that most of the people who engage themselves in Bushmi, as much as they are given maximum sentencing, after they serve the sentence, when they go back to the villages, they engage themselves again in Bushmi cases and other wildlife related. So what we do is we want to now bring in a program that we can engage these ex-convicts and keep connecting them to alternative livelihoods. But also we are engaging uh, the ranches and um, the villages to see how they can establish conservancies as a way of uh, getting benefits from wildlife and also employment to their people and even see how they can reap benefits from this. I think that is all I can say for now. Uh, thank you very much and um, enjoy the remaining part of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth, uh, for your presentation and for staying uh, on time. 
I will ask questions at the tail end uh, of this uh, webinar as they come to us uh, from our uh, participants. Uh, they are logging in, uh, they can fast. I might say we you know, had quite uh, you know, some good registration. Uh, people seem to be interested with this workshop. I hope uh, they learn uh, from us uh, new things. And uh, speaking of which, we have a poll uh, that my colleague Hannah Bernstein uh, will launch uh, 15 minutes uh, to the end of this webinar. And we hope you'll find time to fill it uh, just to tell us uh, your thoughts uh, about the webinar. Uh, again, uh, as you join us, uh, please ask uh, your questions on the Q&A icon uh, down there. And uh, remember to tell us who you are, uh, where you're coming from, and what you do, uh, because uh, the webinar, we not only have, uh, uh, we are journalism organization, uh, so definitely we have um, the policy joining as well as partners uh, in the environment and conservation arena, and most of them are, are also are working under um, in partnership uh, with USAID and the Department of Viteria uh, in the East African uh, mission. Uh, so I will bring in our second uh, speaker, uh, my good friend, uh, Daniel uh, Dizihuwe. Uh, who is currently working as a manager for wildlife and protected areas at WWF uh, in Uganda. He's greatly involved in developing adaptive protected areas and wildlife management strategy, strategies and promoting integrated IT monitoring of biodiversity in Uganda and uh, the, the, the region. Uh, he'll be talking about alternative economic activities uh, to former poachers in Renzori and Queen Elizabeth National Parks, uh, which, and he'll tell us whether this has reduced uh, illegal wildlife crime. Uh, Daniel, uh, since you're coming from Uganda, uh, kindly share your, uh, your presentation and take it over. And if you don't mind, uh, you can mention briefly about uh, the Ebola case uh, that, that broke uh, yesterday. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the moderator, uh, for organizing this. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can see, my name is and is Hue Daniel, as the moderator has uh, said it. I'm the manager of wildlife and protected areas, uh, working with the WWF Uganda. Uh, uh, allow me to put in a presentation mode so that you can be easy can be easy to uh, to exactly see uh, what is projected uh, my presentation is going to be structured in, into uh, this outline and uh, i will uh, brief you about uh, bush meat that's bush meat overview the drivers uh, that are really uh, 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 forcing the, the demand for bush meat uh, to, to continue going higher. And then, uh, of course, uh, uh, the zoonotic viral transmission as a result of bush meat consumption. And we shall also look at other impacts, uh, not only looking at the zoonotic, but also we bear in mind that there are other impacts. Then I have a case to share, uh, especially on East Africa where a survey was conducted and uh, it really has good statistics regarding uh, bush meat consumption. And then of course, uh, I can't uh, do away with the mitigation options that we are currently undertaking and uh, therefore we conclude. Uh, this is the overview, as you are aware, uh, uh, when we talk of illegal uh, meat, uh, that is synonymous to uh, bush meat, and uh, uh, it, it's an act of actually harvesting uh, meat from the wild illegally, and this meat can be used for different purposes, uh, including uh, uh, consumption and, and others. It's a wide uh, business covering the entire world, uh, but of course with a lot of uh, damages in Africa due to different uh, 
uh, social, economic, and political reasons. So briefly, you can see how uh, Congo itself uh, can consume 1 million tons of bush meat per year. And when you look at Central and West Africa, they can consume as much as 5 million tons, tons of bush meat per year. Uh, these are some of the drivers that are actually uh, uh, bringing problems when it comes to rising uh, bush meat consumption in, in Africa, in the world, and in our local countries here in East Africa. Karicha is uh, one of them, uh, where people take bush meat for dignity, magic, and curing different diseases. That's what they believe. And uh, it's a, a serious uh, a pressing issue. Uh, increase the demand for animal protein. Uh, uh, most of these uh, communities that just into protected areas actually used it to get uh, 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 meat from these forests and national parks. But when the Gazette took place, some of them could not do away with that uh, quality protein that is got from uh, wild animals. The encroachment, um, some of the protected areas, of course, uh, surrounded by livestock communities. Uh, most of savannah areas are surrounded by livestock communities and, 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 uh, and uh, these animals can, can easily cross and also people can easily go into the national parks and protected areas to, to good survival and also animals can cross. This is cross-cutting because livestock grazing into the park actually uh, promotes the transmission of zoonotic diseases. Then uh, we can't do away with uh, the aspect of uh, high levels of poverty, where most of the communities are adjacent to protected areas are stricken by poverty and they are forced, of course, to go and hunt and get bush meat. Then uh, minimum, minimal capacity to enforce laws. Uh, some of the countries uh, do not have enough when it comes to enforcing laws. And it is uh, actually related to the next point of wiki policies. And uh, also when it comes to implementation, uh, it is not really at that smart level. And it likely it's also due to uh, corruption in most of our countries. Then political instability, uh, you know how wars can really uh, uh, destabilize every kind of uh, management strategy and everyone can do whatever he wants. The case in Congo where there are very many uh, uh, wars almost all of the time, there are far management of our uh, precious wildlife is hard and, and people can hunt the way they want. Then also there is another factor that we shouldn't take for granted, uh, which is high food prices. You know, in most of our countries, and the most especially here in East Africa, the food prices are high. And the people, uh, instead of dying, they say, well, let's uh, take bush meat. And uh, uh, the recent pandemic of COVID-19, where uh, uh, most of the people were left without to, uh, another choice, as you will see in the report I will share, most of the uh, huntings and the bush meat consumption has risen uh, in the uh, COVID period. Now, uh, we try to relate uh, bush meat consumption and the transmission of uh, zoonotic diseases, most especially viral diseases, as the moderator has been uh, actually uh, uh, talking about it. Uh, in Uganda, we have got a uh, uh, an outbreak of, 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 of Ebola. Ebola is also one of the viral diseases that is believed to originate from uh, wild uh, animals, uh, especially the primates. So in most cases, wild animals actually have the, the zoonotic disease pathogens. In other words, the microorganisms that cause most of these diseases uh, always in wild animals, but because all the animals are having high level of resistance, they can live with the, with the pathogens. But when it comes to livestock uh, that we have in our, in our homes, uh, for them, they have highest affinity of, of those pathogens, and these pathogens can easily weaken the immune systems of our animals. So uh, wild animals uh, really are uh, 
uh, reservoirs of disease do not typically have disease pathogens. And uh, I'm mentioning it clearly here that uh, once we get, into, we get into contact with the wildlife through different uh, avenues like meat, blood, uh, we automatically uh, get the disease and the disease can really cause uh, havoc to, to, to our lives. So some of us could have not been aware that uh, the, the HIV uh, is also traced in some of the chimp species and other primates. Uh, the Ebola I have been talking about, COVID-19, MABA, the swine fever, monkeypox, and also uh, simian form. Most of these diseases, actually all of, all of, all of these diseases uh, can easily be transmitted uh, from humans to these uh, wild animals and vice versa. Um, these are other impacts. Uh, however much the topic is looking at the zoonoses or zoonotic diseases, uh, but we can't, uh, uh, we can't also forget that there are other impacts. For example, the declining wildlife, it is really causing havoc in terms of losing our biodiversity. Uh, due to the fact that even those species that are listed under CITES, um, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species are poached for meat, meaning that they are really at high risk of extinction. The ecosystem malfunctioning, uh, the ecosystem doesn't function when there is less diversity of, 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 of different uh, animal life or uh, uh, and the plant life. Uh, then we are looking at the, uh, the, the risk of shrinking tourism, loss of cultural heritage, the economic crisis, and also other dangerous diseases. However much we are focusing on viral diseases, but there are other diseases which might not necessarily be transmitted by viral pathogens, including anthrax. You remember the outbreak of anthrax that happened in hippos in Uganda, the Rift Valley fever, and also foot animal mouth diseases, especially to to livestock communities once they cross to the protected areas and they meet the pathogens from there. Uh, we are looking at uh, Uganda scenarios. This is not only Uganda scenario, because uh, when you look at the report that I will share, it's not talking about Uganda only. It is supposed to be actually East African scenario as you are going to see. But here it shows that Uganda is, is increasing in terms of uh, bush meat uh, consumption, the same as uh, other East African countries. And you can see that there is a lot of work that has been done by traffic. Traffic is working with the WWF, East African community, and it is getting funding from USAID to undertake all of these so that we can have a lot of data that will guide us when we are deciding on how to manage our our, our wild life. Uh, allow me to switch slightly and take you to and take you to a report before I proceed. Uh, this report uh, was conducted between uh, between November 2020 and May 2021, and it was looking at uh, the entire bush meat saga in East Africa. As you can see, this is the project I was talking about where East Africa is being supported to achieve its mandate of sustainably conserving its resources funded by USAID, but implemented using IUCN traffic and also WWF where we are all participating in giving relevant information. Uh, as you can see, uh, this one reveals uh, 823 traders in Bushmeat, 1,806 1, consumers in the uh, sites that were uh, uh, surveyed. As you can see, these are the areas that, uh, that were sampled in Uganda, in Kenya, and in Tanzania, showing different areas where there has been a significant levels of uh, bushmeat uh, uh, poaching. Then this, this is the summary of results that shows the bushmeat consumption in terms of percentage. And uh, as you can see, Tanzania, 83%, uh, uh, AS, Uganda, 78, and Kenya, uh, uh, 82. But as you can see, there is no 
a statistical significant difference between the consumption of bush meat amongst these East African countries. You can see they are really in the same range, but as you can see, it's, it's really high based on, on these responses that we got from, uh, from uh, respondents. So you can see the, the bush meat consumption frequency, the percentage of people who consume bush meat more than once per week. You can see Kenya, uh, uh, Tanzania, Uganda goes higher. Uh, many people, 64% of the respondents uh, uh, actually expressed that they consume um, bush meat more than once uh, per week, followed by Kenya and also Tanzania. But also you can see the difference is not too significant. We, there is no uh, safe uh, country here. So this is a bush meat availability. As you can see, any time on demand, which is near, that means that all other countries, you can get meat, you can get bush meat at any time you want it. That applies to Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. But Uganda, again, is, is worse, where it is 83% compared to 68% of Tanzania and 60% of Kenya. So uh, these are the means of transporting uh, bush meat, uh, where food dominates. As you can see, uh, uh, the this color means food in Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya. Uh, for Uganda, you can see food dominates, and also other means like a motorbike. They also are also uh, very significant, and Kenya actually looks at motorbike more than uh, the food. So these are the categories of species that are really preferred and the, um, uh, pushed for bush meat. Where ungulates, ungulates, so I mean uh, like cobs and the buffaloes, these are the uh, herbivorous animals are most preferred. As you can see, they go up to 81%. Then followed by primates, such as gorillas, chimpanzees, and other species of monkeys, rodents, and listed pangolins because of their scales. So these pictures are the pictures that we are taken and captured in Savo West National Park in Kenya in 2021. And it shows uh, how these animals had been completely killed. So these are top 10 consumed hundred species. As you can see, we have heart beast, we have many species, but these are regenerative herbivorous animals. So this is the report that shows actually all of the issues that are associated with the uh, bushmeat hunting in Uganda. As I finish, uh, allow me to go back to my uh, presentation so that I, I can conclude. Uh, uh, my last two uh, slides about mit mitigation options and also uh, concluding. Yeah, we are looking at mitigating through global implementation of one health approach. Uh, one health approach is the approach that is uh, using uh, multi-level and uh, uh, considering global as a whole in terms of uh, public health concerns. We're looking at effective management through uh, multi structural governance and also looking at national bans in the meat, in the meat trade, in the bush meat trade and the consumption. Over recent, it has it was it was being implemented in Nigeria, where bush meat consumption was going to be banned, and other European countries have so far even banned banned the the, the, the consumption of bush meat. Then we keep and protect population is at high risk of exposure, especially these people who are always in the protected areas for tourism and other purposes like research. Then we educate and also create awareness and also adequate nutrition and alternative livelihoods. For the protected areas that WWF Uganda works with, all of the communities are being brought on board to think together to see how we can actually avail alternative lives and they, are stopped, they, they can be able to stop to encroach on the protected areas. Then enforcement, of course, this should also not be um, taken for granted. You use carrot and stick when it comes to some of these things. And also we encourage gaming because some of uh, the communities they really like much uh, wild meat, and therefore through gaming, they can get that as an alternative. Then the conclusion is that action should be taken for the rescue, recovery, rebuilding, and expansion of the global network of protected and conserved areas, where we have uniform and universal strategies 
to curb down some of these illegal activities, especially consumption and poaching of bushmeat. And also finally, the need to fully implement one health approach with the goal of achieving optimal health outcomes, recognizing the interconnection between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you so much as well, Daniel, uh, for your uh, incisive uh, uh, presentation. Um, I have a question uh, on the, thank you so much uh, for sharing that report. Uh, also has a lot of, uh, you, you know, findings uh, that, that I think are helpful to everyone joining today. Um, uh, we've noted and you've noted there are very high cases of bushmeat consumption uh, in these South African countries. Uh, can you say, does the report say where uh, uh, the bushmeat uh, is consumed? Uh, is it areas close to wildlife protected areas? Uh, or is it, does it even find its way down to cities and towns? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much for that interesting question. Uh, there is another report that uh, actually uh, locates, actually it, it, it tries to show where the meat is, is sold. And most of the meat, of course, is consumed locally, but the other significant proportion of meat is exported abroad, including uh, to Asian countries. So uh, we have that report. I can as well share the report with you on the on the road destinations of this uh, uh, bush meat. Thank you. And let's share uh, both the reports. We'll greatly appreciate. Uh, we always send like a resource email after our webinars. Uh, so be sure to include that uh, together with your presentations uh, when and if you allow us to do that. And I know you will. Uh, yep. So now we'll go to, yeah. Uh, I know we don't have much time. I'd have come back to you uh, to also, you know, talk about solutions uh, and uh, what you've been doing uh, to give alternative livelihoods to uh, to communities, uh, you know, living in and around uh, the national parks. Uh, but uh, let's hold that thought, and then I'll come back to you uh, after we bring in uh, the other Daniel, Doctor uh, Daniel. Uh, Mdetele uh, from Traffic, uh, who is a senior project manager, wildlife and trade, and One Health, and also a member for pandemic preparedness and response uh, at the East African community. He joined Traffic uh, International after completion of his PhD studies while he was working at the Department of Veterinary Services at the Ministry of Livestock in Tanzania. Uh, where he's been leading animal diseases investigations and control. And uh, he starts uh, at a good place uh, to do, uh, present uh, on bushmeat consumption and associated uh, zoonotic diseases risks, uh, which uh, Daniel of WW River starts on. Uh, I hope, uh, Dr. Mdetele, uh, you'll go uh, mostly uh, into how uh, to create awareness on these and the solutions uh, they are in, especially when it comes to uh, behavior change, uh, communication to communities uh, who, of course, hunt uh, these animals and also the consumers. Are you welcome? And kindly go ahead and share your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, let me no. share my screen. Okay. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kiundu and the panelists and other participants. As Kiundu has mentioned, my name is uh, Daniel Mdetele uh, from Wildlife, uh, uh, in, uh, from Traffic International as a manager on Wildlife Trade One Health, where Daniel has touched a bit about One Health, which is um, suggesting a collaborative approach between different sectors and disciplines uh, in order to have, to achieve optimal health outcomes um, in communities. 
where we are uh, working. Uh, therefore, to my talk will be about bushmeat consumption and associated zoonotic disease uh, risks. As we are all aware, um, almost all diseases are, are caused by pathogens, uh, whether in animals, human or plants, it should be either virus, bacteria, helmif, it can be protozoa or fun fungus. So uh, when we talk of uh, bushmeat and zoonotic diseases, means that actually are uh, diseases which can be uh, can move from uh, wild animals to livestock as well as now it can pass through uh, uh, livestock who, who, uh, that we keep at our homes. Um, normally wildlife harbor those diseases, pathogens, uh, without showing any clinical signs because actually they have, over the years they have generated uh, immunity over those pathogens which are, as I have mentioned, the bacteria, virus and protozoans. But uh, when those pathogens passes to human or livestock, they can inflict the clinical signs where now we we'll start seeing the clinical illness. And how uh, those pathogens can pass, they can be transmitted through contacts uh, when um, uh, human or uh, livestock uh, come into contact with wild animals can get those um, pathogens or if they share probably a leaking place uh, grasses water yeah they can get uh, infection or else they can get through respiration while they uh, uh, ingest air and give out air they can get those pathogens or else they the pathogens can pass through vectors vectors like um, um, sissy flies, ticks, um, uh, fleas and uh, like mosquitoes so uh, when we handle uh, bushmeat uh, which have got those pathogens which I have mentioned they can easily pass uh, through uh, from wild animals to uh, to animals as well when livestock share or come into close contact with wild animals they can get infected and because we are uh, near by the livestock then we get infection uh, um, uh, in a situation like um, uh, one of the zoonotic diseases we can say like rabies, rabies is a zoonotic disease normally a lot is being done on um, livestock uh, on dogs at homes where we vaccinate them and they so that they cannot pass uh, uh, rabies to, to humans but uh, in wild environment the normally the rabies is there so our dogs when hunters go to hunt with dogs and to the uh, bushes they can suck they can fight or they can be bitten by wild animals who have a disease in, in case the dogs have not vaccinated they can carry a, 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 vi a rabies virus to 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 domestic area where now they can spread and people can get a rabies through domestic dog but the source is a wild environment or else the dogs can eat uh, the bush and uh, um, the, uh, the, 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 the bush the, the, the wild animal which has got a disease and they can be used as an intermediate from bush to our households but as well consumption of wild meat can result into um, passing the pathogens from the bush to the domestic and domestic to uh, a human normally those pathogens especially virus when get into livestock they tend to multiply very fast and they can even change from the previous form into a different form they can be not much virulent but when they pass through the livestock they can be much more virulent and uh, tend to be very infectious to uh, humans uh, this can uh, this is situation like in covid uh, situation where we have been hearing that every time we are getting uh, different strains of uh, covid virus because of uh, this um passing through different uh, stages 
they change its uh, status. Therefore, livestock normally serve as an intermediate uh, for zoonotic disease transmission between wildlife and uh, and, the, and, the, and the humans. Um, <coughs> in, East, in East Africa, we have uh, very common zoonotic diseases which normally lives with us for quite a number of have been here for quite a number of years and we have been hearing about those diseases. Diseases like anthrax, uh, it has been there for quite a number of years, uh, circulating between wild animals, livestock and, and humans, as well as diseases like uh, blossolosis. Also, it has been there circulating between uh, wild livestock and, 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 and humans, as well as Rift Valley fever and rabies, which I have men mentioned. But um, uh, reports, uh, studies have shown that, or we know that the diseases like HIV, which we started healing about this disease from uh, 1950s, uh, uh, from I think the HIV we had that from 1959 in Kinshasa, Congo, it was reported there when it was shifted from uh, gorillas into, uh, now we have it in, 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 in human uh, settings and it uh, has been a pandemic circulating all over the, the globe. Diseases like Ebola as well started in years of nine, uh, 70s where it started from uh, wild animals but later on it has slipped and now it is with the, us in, 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 in humans. Other diseases are like uh, Malbag viruses uh, with us, monkeypox virus, simian form, Rift Valley fever, and uh, other forms of uh, COVID, which have been there for a number of years. Uh, this is like uh, SARS, uh, SARS, SARS-1, which was there uh, since then. Then later it came to SARS-2, which we have the disease like uh, Meskov, all those are viral diseases, which have been in animals and at uh, Within time, it has moved from from animals. Now it ha it has shifted and uh, affecting um, uh, uh, humans. Um, <coughs> uh, studies shows that, um, like in Tanzania, uh, analysis from Dar es Salaam, Morogoro, Mbeya, Arusha, and Manyara shows uh, bushmeat. It's regularly, regularly consumed in Tanzania, and the assessment also showed that uh, motorcycles, even public buses, are used to transport uh, this meat. And therefore, this tells us that there is a higher chance of uh, transferring those pathogens from where they are to the rest of the places of the country and can end up into a pandemic or epidemic of um, viral bacterial diseases which uh, originate from uh, such uh, um, products. As well in other regions of Africa like Central Africa you can see there are millions of tons uh, of uh, game meat which are, uh, 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 bush meat which are con uh, harvested in the bush and consumed in towns where it can be um, uh, while they, they are harvested in the bush and brought in towns, they can result into epidemics or pandemics of uh, uh, diseases be, uh, because of uh, pathogens which are found on those uh, uh, products, as well as uh, the Central African uh, Republic. Um, <coughs> the zoonotic disease pathway, how, how uh, zoonotic, this zoonotic disease can pass? Uh, the, our hunters, our hunters are at the highest risk because when they go for hunting, uh, normally they hunt uh, different animal species. But uh, for hunters who hunt uh, species like uh, primate, um, bats, uh, small carnivores, and uh, rats, those are among the species which are very infectious if you compare to other species. So even the different species have, uh, I can say, have different weight on carrying uh, uh, those pathogens, especially the, the viruses. 
as well as uh, processors, those who are processing those products. Uh, probably the hunter after hunting maybe can give can hand over the animal to other people who process those processors uh, also are at high risk because they open they touch and if they are not protected like wearing uh, protective uh, equipment like gloves and masks also can be infected and uh, transfer the pathogens um, to their homes and later on the pathogens can spread and results into outbreaks of our, our, our diseases. The transportation, as we have seen, the transporters, the transporters um, carry those products and because they carry those products, we some which are infected, they can contaminate their um, uh, like uh, cars or if in case of public transport, uh, public, if public transport is contaminated and people touches uh, the contaminated area, can pick those pathogens and uh, uh, spread the pathogens and results into uh, an outbreak or pandemic even um, or endemicity in the, the area. Storage, um, those products are stored in freezers, maybe for cooling and, and because of that, uh, different people touch uh, uh, those uh, storage facilities and can transmit uh, pathogens. And it is well known that mixing different meat from different animals also tend to perpetuate the, the these pathogens, especially the RNA virus. This RNA virus has a tendency of uh, mixing up genetic materials and maybe you can have a pathogen which is not that much infective, but when you mix different um, uh, products with different uh, viral uh, virus with different genetics, when they mix genetic material, then they become much more infective and the much more infective uh, pathogens now can spread and uh, result in an uh, outbreak uh, to community. Also, uh, on the preparations, at, especially at home, uh, uh, mothers, when they process and prepare uh, meat, they touch a fresh meat. If in case that uh, such a meat is not, it has been carrying a pathogen, they can easily get infected, infection, and they can spread to the family members, and later on, it can spread to the rest of the community, as well as eating the not well cooked the meat can uh, spread and uh, uh, results into an outbreak of disease in uh, in such a, a, a communities. Um, now, uh, in that process, as I have mentioned, I think there are a number of uh, stakeholders who have um, different laws on making sure that. Uh, those pathogens do not, uh, first of all, people don't get uh, infected or even if there is a chance of um, getting infected, but they through their activities, they can minimize, um, they, 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 they can minimize the level of the possibility of um, community getting the, uh, the uh, pathogens leaking from um, the wild animals to from the wild, wild animals or bushmeat to uh, the community. The first ones are the regulators, the government people, uh, example, the game officers, um, the veterinarians and uh, medical professionals. Um, they have to play their role in order to make sure, example, the game officers, uh, they have the role on um, law enforcement, as well as in areas where <coughs> um, the, the bushmeat has been legalized, uh, make sure that the procedures, the sanitary procedures are followed, like a meat inspection, and all necessary procedures for sanitary and phytosanitary, uh, so that to, to, in order to get a safe meat is followed, as well as the hunters. The hunters also they have a role to play, uh, by making sure that uh, they follow all um, 
regulations or requirement on hunting so that they cannot get it or cannot contract the infection. The, as well as the processors, those who are processing uh, meat in case it, is it has been legalized, they need to have the protective gears or proper gears uh, and uh, proper equipment for processing uh, such uh, products and they have to make sure that um, such uh, equipment are well sanitized uh, as they proceed. The transporters, those who uh, there, there should be uh, specialized equipment for transporting uh, such products rather than using a public transport or uh, also other uh, means of transport which hasn't been officiated for, uh, uh, for for such work. Sellers, those who are selling as well, they should make sure that they are well protected uh, to prevent that to prevent the disease from moving to from getting infected and later on trans, uh, transmitting the disease to 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 to, to, to the rest of uh, uh, communities. Traders, sellers and traders, I think are the the same. Consumers, for us who are uh, for those who are consuming at home, they have they have responsibility of making sure that they handle uh, with care such products and make sure that they, they source um, the meat from um, um, legal sources rather than just getting from anywhere where they can end up. Um, uh, getting into problems as the source of uh, a uh, 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 product which hasn't uh, has not been passed through a uh, uh, proper channel legal channels the international organizations see uh, setting standards um, for uh, meat products uh, 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 business also they have the responsibility of making sure that um, Whoever is doing uh, such a business follows all those um, um, sanitary and phytosanitary procedures so, so that they can, cannot allow the pathogens to pass from um, such a, uh, bushmeat into a, a community. So all those things um, uh, need uh, behavior, uh, human behavioral change uh, in order to abide to laws and regulations and uh, harvest uh, bush meat responsibly. Also, we need to, have, to, they will need, we need to consider into the environmental changes which are uh, happening and also human wildlife interactions need to be considered as I have mentioned that uh, some, some do um, hunt uh, get bush meat using our dogs and what so with that uh, such interaction they can easily uh, take uh, transfer the pathogens from a uh, wild environment to uh, uh, human settings settlement um, key to success uh, on prevention of uh, epidemics and uh, pandemics of pathogens originating from um, uh, wild animals uh, first is awareness creation where the uh, different stakeholders have the role to play on awareness creation and the behavioral changes of the community. Also, we need to have an outreach program on <coughs> to uh, communities um, uh, really who are found in the interface to make sure that um, uh, they <coughs> Uh, they, 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 they get to the community and educate them about uh, the importance of uh, sourcing uh, this uh, game meat legally and responsibly. Also, law enforcers, they have to make sure that whenever necessary, uh, law enforcement is um, uh, uh, applied. Also, we need to have uh, an alternative source of protein for communities where uh, for the communities which um, mostly rely on game, uh, uh, bush meat, they have to have an alternative source of, of protein, as well as some relies on bush meat for income. For such a communities also, they need to have an alternative means of, of living. 
Now, in order to for prevention and response, just in case um, uh, pre uh, prevention and uh, response to the possible end endemicity and the pandemic outbreak, uh, we need to uh, to monitor and do surveillance. This is surveillance on the wider setups where data uh, for diseases are collected and uh, analyzed to see the prevalence, presence, prevalence of uh, such a zoonotic diseases on those areas and advise those who are sourcing legally uh, and responsibly whether they can uh, source or not source depending on the situation of um, uh, 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 um, uh, availability of those pathogens. As well, we need to equip well on air detection where we need to have um, laboratories and the, yeah, laboratories, protective gears and any kind of um, uh, materials which are, can help on preventing uh, pathogens from passing from wild to humans, uh, equipment like uh, gloves, um, um, <coughs> gloves, masks when working on a such an environment, as well as L for air detection, we need to have a laboratory and uh, laboratory consumables for uh, detection of, um, of, 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 of such a path pathogens. As well, uh, in case we have an outbreak, we need to get prepared to respond. And like uh, uh, when we are caught within with the COVID-19, the world was not yet prepared. So we need to get prepared by having all uh, necessary um, e equipments and uh, I can say budgetary for responding uh, against the, any kind of uh, pandemic which can uh, occur because of um, uh, such a, a, a pathogens. And finally, thank you for listening. I uh, would like to thank the USAID and the GIZ for their support to traffic on its work on uh, bushmeat and zoonotic disease risks. Okay. Thank you. Indeed, uh, Dr. Mzetele, thank you so much. Uh, for your presentation, presentation as well. Um, I will ask, you know, Dandy WWF to come back for five minutes before we go to the questions. I'm saying we have good questions, and especially because uh, Dr. Mdetele, you've mentioned about alternative livelihoods and alternative uh, uh, sources of protein. And uh, I think there is a program that is doing just that. Uh, Daniel, please, if you could take Take five minutes to tell us what you're doing at the Queen Elizabeth National Park in Renzori. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator, for this uh, discussion. I'm happy to uh, share the experience uh, from Uganda and specifically working with the communities uh, to ensure that uh, their lives are changed, they are transformed in different aspects, including behavioral change. Uh, we are currently uh, working with all of the communities of Gwenzori Mountains National Park uh, to ensure that uh, they have got uh, alternative rivalries and uh, they are uh, really uh, uh, transformed in terms of the way they think, the way they participate in a conservation work. We have supported also communities around the Gwenzori Mountain, uh, North Gwenzori, uh, Queen Elizabeth National Park. And the, the strategy is uh, we have uh, 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 data related to illegal uh, wildlife uh, activities. And that data actually guides us when we are focusing on different areas uh, to embark on when it comes to uh, giving them alternative livelihoods uh, so that they cannot uh, continue to encroach on the uh, park resources, uh, particularly the wildlife for meat. Uh, uh, we, we, let me begin with the Gwenzol. Uh, for Gwenzol, uh, we have supported the 11 community groups, and uh, these community groups are made of reformed poachers, 
uh, reformed poachers means someone who, who used it to poach, but uh, because of the uh, sensitization and uh, awareness creation sessions, they stop uh, uh, to poach and they are brought together as an association. So we call them reformed poacher groups and they are made of men who stopped poaching their wives and also their children. So we sit with them and uh, adaptively uh, agree on appropriate projects that they would undertake. And then we support them as WWF Uganda to take those projects, including training, to ensure that they know how to manage enterprises and they can get money out of them. Uh, so far, we've supported them with the um, uh, beekeeping. Uh, they are doing commercial beekeeping. They are connected to private sector that now connects them to business. So they have money. So when they have money, there is no way they can again go and start uh, destabilizing park resources. Another unique thing we have done with these communities, we have uh, developed resource use MOUs, the Memorandum of Understanding uh, for Use of the Resources within the park, but in a more systematic manner, where they can harvest some of the resources for craft making, staking, and others, but in a more uh, sustainable manner. And uh, this would link them uh, to the park management. And now we are achieving the objective of uh, collaborative management of the park resources. Uh, let me finalize with Queen Elizabeth National Park. I was happy to host the uh, interviews team uh, uh, two months back. And we went to Queen Elizabeth National Park to practically appreciate how we have uh, also created the uh, reformed poacher groups, the groups that we used it to hunt for meat. And now they are working together uh, towards the sustainable development without even going back to the park. So uh, we visited a group in Kameme and uh, we appreciated the Pigari project that they are uh, running and a complete safe system where no uh, carnivorous animal can attack their pigs and their pigs cannot even go to the park to amplify the conflict between human and wildlife because of that embracement of the safe system where the pigs are producing, each member is getting a pig and they're also constructing the, the same kind of shelter to reduce really uh, conflicts at the same time, uh, reducing uh, on dependency, on or reducing dependence on wildlife for meat. So we are really doing great in, in the landscape, but uh, the limitation of course has always been scaling up. We are piloting this and uh, they are doing well. So what we are going to do is to scale up to other areas where uh, the, 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 the crime is also high, and therefore, it is a question of time uh, we shall really achieve our, our target. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel, uh, for uh, that information. And indeed, uh, we, uh, we came down to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, with a bunch of uh, reporters from the region, and we experienced the uh, you know good work uh, that is being uh, done there, and a couple of stories have come out uh, from that trip. And uh, in that resource email, I will uh, I, I will share the stories uh, to our colleagues who will be interested to take it further. Uh, as we had promised, uh, Hannah has launched um, uh, the. Uh, the poll can really take time uh, to fill it up as we answer a few questions uh, that have been put to different speakers. Uh, I see uh, uh, most people are not seeing where they are from, uh, who they work for, uh, but it's all good. I will go ahead and ask uh, the questions. And also, if you type from now on, uh, kindly uh, make sure you mention who you would like to take uh, that question. Uh, some of them, uh, if we find that they've been answered, uh, we'll kindly allow us to bypass them. Um, uh, Charles Ogalo, uh, if you can look at that panelist, uh, is asking, we've, uh, we've answered, a bit, you've answered a bit of that question, uh, but at the end they are asking, or he is asking uh, why this uh, zoologically related diseases come viruses are, less evident in the continent uh, that is Africa as compared to Asia. 
uh, all the things that we've spoken about. Uh, is that a fact? Uh, please, any of the speakers can let us know that. And maybe we can take Dennis uh, Lubanga. I think he's an editor with Tuko in Kenya. I would appreciate if you share the data in regard to number of wildlife uh, that could have been killed uh, through poaching across the last African, the East Africa region in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, good question, I think. And uh, Marco, uh, Pastori from uh, Radio Quizera in Tanzania is asking, how can we block the link between uh, the viral diseases from bushmeat uh, to human beings uh, through livestock around the East African country? Uh, if we could start with uh, uh, Kenneth, uh, you can take uh, one of those questions uh, that you're comfortable with. And then we'll come to Daniel from Uganda and then Daniel from Tanzania. And then from there, I'll pick the question that uh, goes to a specific speaker. Uh, thank you, moderator. Um, I think some of these questions are technical, so I leave it to the um, to Daniel from Traffic. But for the data on um, bushmeat in relation to COVID, probably I can share with you uh, on the, for for the servo. Then you can share with the team later on. Thank you. That would be great. That would be great, Kenneth. I will really appreciate that. Uh, Janil from Traffic, if you could take any of those three questions. Yeah, maybe um, just to mention the last one, which I, I had it uh, correctly, the blocking the link between the viral, uh, 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 these pathogens from wildlife to humans. As I have uh, mentioned it, um, there are uh, different, uh, different, uh, different ways of blocking the link first of all um for some of the pathogens most of the pathogens we have been doing it especially on, on the veterinary part side of it uh it's like uh, the disease like anthrax in tanzania it has been we had been we, we were having a lot of uh, anthrax in our communities but thanks through our vaccination uh, routine on uh, livestock we have managed to block the linkage between the wild, uh, the livestock, and the uh, human. So uh, at the moment, uh, we haven't had any human cases, at least in some places where they have not been vaccinating. Uh, there are a bit of uh, um, cases in, in, in livestock. But uh, vaccination uh, against the diseases which have got uh, vaccines is the best way to block the, the linkage. Um, uh, of those uh, of those pathogens, diseases like anthrax, lift valley fever, um, and yeah, and other diseases which have got our vaccines. That is the best way. Another alternative is making sure that um, uh, consumption of uh, consumption of uh, wild meat is consumed responsibly where they should come from the uh, legal sources, where if they come from legal sources, it means that they will pass through uh, uh, proper procedures where they will be inspected. And once they are inspected, it means we'll be sure that at least these uh, such products are safe from uh, consuming it. Um, yeah, I can say uh, those are the uh, one uh, among the ways which we can uh, limit uh, 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 the pathogens. Another thing is just uh, using use of the protective uh, uh, equipment uh, gears when uh, processing, uh, especially uh, yeah, when processing. If you use the protective gears, yes, you can uh, limit the uh, the pathogens from uh, wild setup into uh, a, 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 a human uh, settlements. Thank you so much. Uh, again, to you, is it a fact uh, that uh, Asia is more prevalent uh, in zoonotics uh, than in Africa? Uh, okay. Okay. Actually, um, the equator, tro uh, the tropical, all of the tropical area, uh, especially Asia, uh, Africa, and part of um, of South America, 
all, all, the, all areas which are found along the equator are the hot, are hot spots for these pathogens because I think of the climatic condition, they favor um, multiplication of those, of those pathogens. And uh, we are lucky, I think, in Africa because of um, our population is not that much big like that of Asia. That's why we are not uh, uh, seeing um, uh, much of the outbreaks of the pandemics of, uh, of those pathogens. But uh, in Asia, I think because of the population and being on the same region, which is a hotspot, that's why they are at the moment they are having um, such a large number of um, uh, a, a viral diseases, especially the respiratory one, because you learn that the the SARS one was also found in in in, in started in Hanoi, Vietnam, yeah. and. The, as well, the SARS-2, which is COVID-19, also started on the same region. So I think it's because of uh, their population, and uh, but we are on the same uh, port of the hotspot for, 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 for these pathogens. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the other Daniel uh, has his hands up, but before you go, Daniel, uh, let's finish with uh, Dr. Mdetel because there is a question that is I find intriguing here uh, from Peter Labeja uh, from Uganda. He's asking, what do we know about as far as graves are concerned? Uh, do they pose dangers uh, to the population? In Uganda, there is fear where I come from, north of the country, where the graves of the victims of the 2000 Ebola outbreak were buried. Uh, could they still be infectious or dangerous? Dr. Mdetela, please clarify. Yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> as far as I know, the these pathogens, the virus, have a favorable environment to, to survive, and they have a limit of time to survive. Uh, graves, as it is, it means people, uh, the, 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 the victims were buried deep down in the graves, and those graves were covered, and the times have lapsed. So there's no possibility that such virus uh, could be arrived at the moment, C could be still uh, living at this moment. Actually, they can, the, the only uh, period which they can survive is only three, four days. It's over, and there's no possibility that they can be a threat at the moment. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for that, and thank God uh, for that answer. Uh, so, Daniel, WWF, as you take... Uh, you answer uh, the previous questions and the remarks to what Dr. Mutella had said. I would like for you to answer two more questions that I think will be directed to you. Uh, one is from Pauline Cairo, uh, Nation Kenya. And she's asking, uh, 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 what life question goes to you? Has the recent case of Ebola in Uganda been linked to bushmeat consumption uh, for sure? Um, and Drew uh, McVeigh is asking, what about transmission from people to wildlife such as COVID-19? Uh, can you take those? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for those questions. Uh, I will first, uh, um, I don't know uh, what Dr. Uh, Daniel has uh, talked about uh, regarding uh, the, 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 the severity of some of these uh, zoonotic diseases in Asia being higher uh, than uh, some of other continents. Uh, some, there are many reports that show that uh, the consumption of bush meat in Asian countries is high, and that can uh, actually uh, translate to, uh, to high incidences of, uh, of this virus and other zoonotic diseases uh, in such areas compared to other parts of the world. Then uh, uh, I also was concerned about the question on uh, the disposure of uh, victims of some of these diseases, for example, Ebola. Uh, to viruses, the doctor has made it clear it's not a concern, but to some other pathogens, especially the, the pathogen that causes anthrax, the, the bacillus anthrax is, is dangerous. It can stay in the soil for some good time. 
and therefore uh, disposal disposal of the of the um, uh, carcasses is supposed to be uh, taken precautionary and they ensure that they are buried uh, very very deep and the area is not even uh, used to do uh, some of other activities because the bacteria sometimes can stay for so long it's not like a virus then uh, coming to the question that is uh, posed to me directly about to uh, uh, the, the, the one which was posed uh, uh, moderator can you uh, repeat it because I was not looking at it the first question the uh, is it the the one that was directed to you uh, yeah. was Colin Cairo uh, has the recent case of Ebola in Uganda been linked to bushmeat cons consumption for sure? Not yet, not yet confirmed, but uh, the findings will soon be uh, released. So for now, it is hard to associate it with the uh, bushmeat consumption. But we know that uh, uh, originally uh, this disease was coming from uh, from primates. And most of the tribes in Uganda, it, it primates, uh, including some of the tribes here in Kasese near Wenzod. So it could be linked, but uh, so far uh, not yet confirmed, uh, spe specifically for this case in Uganda. Then coming to the question from Drew, uh, Drew is also uh, an experienced wildlife conservationist. It is true that uh, the, 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 the zoonotic diseases actually can go the other way around. They are, the disease can easily cross from human beings uh, to primates and other wild animals. The same applies from wild animals to human beings. The case of COVID-19. COVID-19 can easily cross from humans to primates. The case of AIDS it can easily tra get transmitted from human beings to primates and the other way around. I think uh, that's what I could say uh, about uh, those questions. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I was trying to look for another question that is directly uh, for you. Uh, but but, but uh, maybe Kenneth, can you tell us there is a question that you know uh, I can't trees anymore and I was talking about uh, the Motin Bongo uh, uh, in Kenya. Are uh, there indigenous species like the Motin Bongo in various ecosystems in Kenya? Can you share the date data on the most indigenous species recently reported uh, for bushmeat? Uh, would you have that, Kenneth? Um, I didn't get the question clearly, especially on the Mountain Bongos. Um, Mm -hmm. But um, I might not be having the data on bushmeat related to bongos. But um, as I said before, I'm willing to share this after this. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, anyone can check this kindly. Uh, we were slated to finish at uh, half past, and I see we have passed, uh, but please, uh, we ask for indulgence for one more question uh, from. Gilbert Koech, uh, the star of Red Africa in Kenya, uh, he has two questions. Human population is increasing, leading to encroachment of protected areas. Climate change is complicating this. With this in your mind, do we expect another outbreak of COVID-19 like diseases? And what are the advantages of one health approach and can it work in the African setting? Uh, I, I think we've uh, spoken about that. If you could take number one, please. Any one of you can go, please. Let, her, let us take it first. Indeed, the human population is increasing. And as the human population is increasing, I think it put pressure on the ecosystems. As a result of the ecosystems are distracted and climate change is happening now. And the situation is getting worse and encroachment into a protected area areas is increasing indeed there is a higher possibility of having a probable other uh, pandemics in the future as in um, pathogens the known pathogens and the unknown pathogens which are there uh, 
the, the, the known and the unknown pathogens at least for the known pathogens we have the means and the ways to solve it uh, immediately but for the unknown pathogens it probably it will take time to 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 to, uh, to act on it unless otherwise uh, maybe because of the lesson learned from the current pandemic though it is not the first pandemic we had also previous pandemic uh, like the the spain flu um, during those years and as well as diseases like plaque during those years also really uh, troubled the world but uh, it we keep on learning on uh, on those issues so the most important thing is just get prepared, uh, especially for scientists, uh, develop, uh, as I have mentioned on my presentations, uh, that we should have uh, well-equipped laboratories which can detect error, because if you, we detect error, it will be easier to act upon or plan for the prevent, uh, prevention. And uh, as well, we need to get prepared to have um, um budget for emergencies in at least as a block as a region or as countries for uh acting whenever uh, such a pandemic can uh, come so that we can uh, limit it early before it is spread to um uh, a larger part of the region or even the globe thank you Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mdetele. Um, I know most of us, uh, of the speakers, uh, would want to drop off. Um, uh, hoping everybody has been able to uh, to answer to the poll. Uh, Hannah, uh, I don't know if you're able to uh, launch the survey as well. As we uh, take one final question from you, uh, Daniel, uh, WWF. Uh, that uh, I, I think is quite um, interesting. Uh, how are you ensuring, this is from Aaron Aino Mugisha. Uh, he is the leader of Rise News Uganda Network and Rise Against Poverty Organization in Uganda as well. He's asking, how are you ensuring that you totally eliminate the relationship between the transformed poachers and their clients who might seduce them again? Yeah, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, it is uh, uh, a bit hard to uh, establish that uh, you have uh, uh, cut the off the, 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 the client's uh, chain, but uh, being uh, at the level of the local community, Oh, the, 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 these uh, community members continue to, to coordinate. That's why we, we bring them together uh, so that uh, even if uh, there are those who are still having the vice of linking up with the, with the clients, they have uh, the, the highest possibility of even uh, of being recognized by other community members. So uh, once uh, they are reformed, they are brought together to do collective work and uh, uh, we are trying to bring on board uh, uh, a community uh, uh, task forces that are going to be collecting data and share with the responsible data managers uh, uh, in different uh, protected areas we are working with uh, uh, and the information continue to follow uh, uh, to, 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 to go to, to uh, 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 protected area management unit. So, uh, uh, having been reformed and also uh, having been brought together and also having uh, formed all of those task forces that are supposed to use even a smart mobile to send information from the communities, that would really guarantee that uh, the connection between these people and the clients is, is really uh, uh, broke completely. But uh, of course, uh, we need to, to, to conduct maybe some other surveys to find out if uh, uh, the, the linkage has been completely uh, put down. But so far, what we are doing is to ensure that 
they are reformed and they are reporting on any illegal activity that takes place. And therefore, that would really make uh, those areas very secure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you, Daniel. Before you go, uh, now following the outbreak uh, of the Ebola uh, that's been declared by the Ugandan government, what are we likely to see uh, in the next couple of days? Yeah. Uh, we expect, of course, a vigilance in terms of uh, uh, following standard operating procedures and also continuing to, 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 to do surveillance to ensure that uh, any other kind of uh, case is very well recorded and the source of the case can be traced so that we are able to deal with whatever comes. But uh, for now, it is all about being vigilant and ensuring that. Uh, everything is recorded and uh, the, the, the preventive measures are taken uh, seriously. Thank yeah, you so over. much. Thank you so much, uh, Daniel uh, Dizihiwe uh, from uh, WWF Uganda, as well as Dr. Daniel Mbitewe from Traffic uh, based in Tanzania, as well as Kenneth Kimitei of AWF, base in Kenya, the Savom Komazi area, uh, for you making time uh, to join us in this webinar and for you, you know, a great knowledge uh, on this topic. Uh, I'm sure our participants uh, have learned a lot. And speaking of which, I'd like to thank you as well, our, our participants, uh, wherever you're joining from, whatever organization you are in, uh, from media to conservation partners uh, for making time here. Uh, in good numbers, we had over 100 people, uh, you know, at the webinar, and uh, I see a good number of you have responded to our poll. We don't take it for granted. Uh, thank you so much, and we get back to you as we said uh, with the resources uh, from this webinar, which will also uh, enroll. I mean, upload on our website of journalism.net. And there's someone on uh, on the chat who was asking uh, whether we have opportunities uh, for reporters, and indeed uh, we do have. I'll encourage you to go to the website and see our resources tab and uh, you can join uh, one of our uh, close to 15,000 Afros uh, from across the world who receive our resources and opportunities uh, every time we have them. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank uh, USAID and the Department of Interior uh, for their support uh, in journalism uh, in East Africa uh, for us to be able to tell the story of environment and climate change better. I do wish you a good afternoon and good evening. Kwaherini, bye. Thank you, good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, thank you.